Hello, everybody. We are Hello. On... Hello, everybody. I'm everybody. <laughs> You're one of everybody. That's true, but I'm representing everybody today. Well, thank you, everybody, for what being What happened to here. your red arrows? Where are the red arrows? Where's the big text? I just A lot of people do trailer breakdowns now, and it's just not that interesting to me. I mean, to me, at this point, Easter eggs... And look, I love this stuff, but like, I don't want to just list things anymore. List Have, a few things. Okay, uh, well, here, I'll list three things. Okay, great. So, Yay! <laughs> so we are on the road to James Cameron's Avatar 2. That's one thing. We're in the water, everyone. Nice. And to do that, I feel like there are three films that absolutely are the stepping stones to that. Oh, yeah. One is Avatar 2009. I'm sure that helps. For obvious reasons. The other one is Titanic. Mm -hmm. And the first of which we're going to cover out of all of these is the abyss, Mason. Which is fascinating. I'll tell Which you part? The fact that you and everybody, because that's who you represent, is leaving a like on this? Clickety-click. Great. Um, what's fascinating about the abyss is that we were like, let's, let's watch and talk about the abyss. And I thought to myself, well, it's from James Cameron, the Terminator movies, Titanic, yep. Avatar, some of the most well-regarded and most profitable movies of True all lies. time. True lies. True lies. I'll just find this on one of our local streaming services. Yeah. It's not there. So I'm like, I'll go down to my local DVD purveyor. <laughs> that guy who sells DVDs out of the trunk of his car. Yeah. Wasn't there either. I thought <laughs> I'll, I'll get it for five bucks or whatever. It's yeah. different. It's probably different in America, but you just can't get it well, here. I'm it like, is, this is fascinating. It is one of those ones that is due for like a restoration 4K update, but James Cameron hasn't done it as of yet. He's too busy in the in the world of Pandora. It's probably too soggy. The original it, it is, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Once we've dried this out, we're gonna put it. We're gonna put it on a beach towel on the beach. Exactly. Now I gotta say, I I just assumed that maybe I've seen this. I remember mm. the water face, but watching this, I'm like, oh, I don't know anything about this at mm, all. Same. I think I, I've like vague flashes of it from my childhood, but no idea it was about. Well, I knew it was aliens, but I didn't know it was like a lost nuclear warhead and etc. Mm. But we also looked at the extended cut. That's which true. Is we did thirty minutes. Or extra stuff going on here. I think the flashes of it that you remember are probably advertisements for it on, like, <laughs> Channel 10 when we were kids. Yes. And they, it would have been the 8.30 Sunday night movie. It would have, would have gone till after midnight. Or over two nights with the extended oh, yeah. version, which came out in 93. But what did strike me about this movie is that it might be the most James Cameron thing that's ever happened. Mm. Because we've got the ocean. Sure. We've got aliens. We've got little underwater submarines. That's right. This is... Everything that he loves. Yeah. And he's trapped a whole lot of actors and crew on the <laughs> set and tortured them for months, which I will get to. There is a whole section about how everybody nearly died and hated making this movie. Interesting. Yeah. And you see it. Maybe that's why it's not available on DVD in this country because of evidence. It's, it's, it's required as evidence in various criminal cases that are still ongoing. Yeah, but there's not a lot of stunt work in this. It's mostly the actors doing it themselves and 40% of the principal photography is underwater. Yeah. And you incredible. can see that. For sure. Like, it, it's quite refreshing to... I mean, water, first of all, is very refreshing. Mm. But it's quite refreshing to watch an old, quote-unquote, old movie that is kind of, a you know, a big... A lot of, lot of big set pieces and action, what have you, that is filmed on real sets and it's set underwater and yeah. it's filmed underwater. It's not just green-screened and... Well, even back then, like, it could I mean, he couldn't do it. No. I mean, a lot of this is miniatures or really bigatures... Because oh. one of the ships that they built... Bigoted miniatures? <laughs> it's a Peter Jackson thing from Lord of the Rings. It's what they call them. They're not bigoted. They're very accepting, Mason. Go back to your own model <laughs> railway. It's an example of a bigoture. That's really good, Mason. But the thing is, I feel like this movie does scale really well a number of ways. And one of them is with big miniatures. Bigotures, if you mm. will, Mason. Oh, I will. Because like, I feel like the stuff that that is like that lit up and, and floats around and breaks up, it's all very convincing. And one of the model ships that was used for this was so large and they filmed it on the open sea, which meant they needed to register it with the Coast Guard. Oh. Like, that's the kind of stuff as that they're buoy? working with. Yeah, as a buoy. And they used a nuclear reactor housing, which was a 55-foot tall bowl, 240 feet in diameter, which they shot in, which meant basically... They put in 7.5 million gallons of water and they built that superstructure within it, Whoa. or some of it at least. Sounds like somebody was smoking a huge bowl, if you know what I mean. You're not wrong, Mason. Get this all done, you know what I mean? 
And as a result of that, it feels vast. You don't see the you don't see the walls of anything. It was obviously the biggest tank that had ever happened at this point. Sure. And it was nearly the biggest tank when it went to the box office, which was not quite. We'll talk about it. That's pretty good. Did you prepare that? No, I didn't. Did That's you great. like it though? I liked it. And you're everybody. It's true. Everybody so that liked means that. everybody liked it. But things like the sinking of the station, incredible. The crane comes down, and the idea that after that accident happens, they never cut back to the surface. Yeah. I mean, we do at the end, but. We're just trapped down there with all these dirty people. Yuck. A <laughs> man sticks his hand in the toilet and it stays blue the entire time. What movie. is that, Mason? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's what happens when you stay underwater for too long. Your poo goes blue. His hand is blue the entire movie. Uh -huh. Just a man living his life after putting his hand in a blue toilet bowl and not washing it. <laughs> I'm sure it was some kind of chemical agent that they probably used in submarines or whatever. Yeah, great cast, by the way. The, the great Ed Harris. Amazing. Uh, but later in the movie, he does... He does tenderly touch the cheek of Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio, and she she isn't like, did you stick your hand in the toilet? <laughs> it's still blue. It's toilet blue. It is toilet blue, it's, isn't it? It's toilet duck extreme. <laughs> yeah, it, it might just be, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, a young Ed Harris. A lot of young yeah. example. Mary, Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio, obviously. Yep. We've got a young Chris Elliott, who's a, a great comic actor. Yep. We, get a young, uh, we get a young and beautifully mustachioed Michael Bean, Ooh. the world's favourite Mr Bean. Yeah, mate, I concerned. think so. Yeah. Between you and me, Mason, I'm going to agree with you on that mm. one. Yeah. Too beautiful to put a turkey on his head, though. <laughs> Absolutely. Be a waste. You actually asked me this before the show, and it's absolutely true. You were like, was James Cameron going through a divorce when he made this? Mm. Because the female lead in this, everyone up top in this movie is just like, what a bitch. Yeah. Look at this bitch. And even when she's dead and Ed Harris is trying to revive her, he's like, wake up, you bitch. And then at the end... Wake up so you can take some more alimony payments, you bitch. And then at the end when she's talking to Ed Harris when he's diving depths and whatever, she's like, I'm a bitch. And this is why I'm a bitch. I'm like, what is happening in this fucking movie? And here's the thing. It's spectacular and it's cast well, but it's not great, is it? No, but as you were going to say, uh, as you mentioned just then, uh, the, the scene where he has to revive... His, his ex-wife. That's so tense. And I think it's... And tense in real life, which we'll talk about. Oh, it's on my no. list of harrowing things that happen, Ooh, basically. Oh, but just, the, you know, because we've spent so much time underwater and, and we don't, you know, we don't know these characters very well. I'm like, who... What's, what's, what's going to happen, James? But I think it was very, very well done. Yeah, I completely agree. But yeah, also shout out to Michael Bean, uh, who's just a, just a paranoid man with, uh, with some kind of ocean madness. Yes, that's which right. Which may or may not be a real thing that's uh -huh. going on. And I love that he's... It's scurvy. That's what happens when he gets scurvy. He's got scurvy. And he's, like, entirely mad for the length of this movie, even before he goes under, really. Apparently it was Michael Bean's idea to be like, maybe we give him a reason to just go insane and go after a nuclear weapon. But everybody knows that he's going insane and that he has a nuclear weapon, but the only guy keeping an eye on him is the guy with the rat. Mm, sure. Mm -hmm. He's got his little submarine and he's giving, a, he's giving him a, a good look-see. Like, you... you Keep a closer eye on Michael Bean in this movie if you yeah. could. I think this got out of hand several times because of Michael Bean. Agreed. Yeah, even though he is the best Mr. Bean. What about the visual effects? Do you have any, any notes on the visual effects? Because all I remember from this, the only, I'd, I'd never seen this before, but my only memory of it was in the... Um, it's a big water face, isn't it? Well, it's the big water face, but I only remember it in the lead up to Terminator 2 because yes. I remember all the press was like... He's built on the incredible effects from the Abyss to build the T-1000. It's the yep. same technology, but it's massively evolved, and I guess I was expecting something better than this. Really? I thought it was really impressive. Like for, the, for the time, absolutely. Especially yeah. for the year. Well, this is how they did it. So it was initially going to be a cell animation, or it was going to be a tentacled sculpture in A Roger clay. Rabbit style. Yes, that's right. Okay. <laughs> Please let me in. I'm a ward, is snake. You didn't even like the bit where they closed the door and all no, the No, I did quite like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm being too harsh, obviously. Yeah. In the in the, the lens of 2022, I'm like, well, blah, blah. that being said. <laughs> Not as good as a, a better movie that I saw <laughs> this year. Right. Yeah. But pr still better than everybody else who tried to do a T-1000 effect post-Terminator 2. Still way better than that. Yeah, fair enough. It was also, they were considering maybe we do this stop motion with water reflections, like projected onto it. And they actually... Oh, as a Muppet. As a Muppet, exactly. Okay. Please help me, man. <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, and the way they did it is they filmed that first, which meant... The team working on it had nine months to get it right. Okay, great and, idea. Which is amazing because now you could just do this on your phone, and right, it would sure. it, and it wouldn't look as good as Terminator Two, Mason. Mm. But you could get it. You could get it pretty close. You could get it ninety five percent of the way there. Yeah, I think that's perfect. The, yeah, just and and perhaps a lesson that present day filmmakers could learn. If you need somebody to do some special effects, 
Give them nine months. <laughs> Do it first. And, and then... don't change it every month. Okay, so I think this movie is simultaneously incredibly harrowing. You know when they've got like the dead submarine crew mm. and those are all real people just holding their breath being like, I'm dead, I'm a submarine crew. Like going through and seeing all those people. <laughs> now you're an extra. You've got to focus really hard on two things. You're dead and you're a submarine crew. Yes, and there's incredibly harrowing. We can hand out some T-shirts if necessary. <laughs> if you go and do it, we'll turn your face away from the camera. We'll let you wear the T-shirt. <laughs> but... I think it's really good at harrowing moments, you know, just people being claustrophobic and stuck mm. and, and like water's rushing in and they're putting on helmets that are filled with water also and mm. it's, it's all terrifying. But at the same time, there are way too many just loving shots of stations and submarines and, <laughs> and underwater vessels. Music. And stirring music. And I think a lot of that could probably go. And I think also this is the extended version that we watched. Mm -hmm. You know, often we, you know, going into this, we think, you know, which version, you know, which version do we look at? Which best represents mm. maybe the vision of the director? And then uh, I was like, oh, this one. This is the one I found first. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Terrific. I mean, this this obviously, this, this evidently had greater themes of uh, uh, US versus the Soviet uh, Union sure. kind of conflict, mm. uh, which, you know, perhaps weighed it down a little bit. But then it also had a big wave that was going to crush the whole world. Or and something. everyone was like, oh, no. <laughs> and then they went, we don't have the budget for a big wave to hit anything. Yeah. So we're just going to stop the wave and the but wave. But then, as I, as I understand it, then years later, when uh, the opportunity for a director's cut was, uh, was on the table, mm. ILM, who did many of the visual effects, was like, yeah, we can do a big wave now. Yeah, so initially in the test screening, James Cameron had like a placeholder, which was mm. like a storyboard that was like, there's a big wave. And half the people were like, this sucks, we hate <laughs> this. And then he took it out, but then he realised oh, I shouldn't show people unfinished effects because some people are too dumb to be like, mm -hmm. oh, this isn't what it's going to look like in the final movie. So that for him was the indication that, oh, I'll put this back in. Yeah, right. The way that they get rid of Michael Bean, which is two submarines crashing into each other, uh -huh. isn't as interesting as, say, like an alien versus a person in a mech or a person versus a Terminator sure. or a Terminator versus a Terminator mm -hmm. or Billy Zane versus Kate Winslet. Sure. I think this idea of just two underwater vessels crashing into each other there's not a lot of there's not a lot you can do with that, okay. you know, and it's just like clang, and then they back up, and then they clang again. Okay. And but I I will say this, Michael Bean, the best Mr. Bean, his death, that explosion, and yeah. it kind of folds in, and then the bubble comes out of the ship. Mm -hmm. Very good, like that a lot, Mason. So overall, your opinion of his death is neutral. It seems. <laughs> yeah, it's right, exactly. <laughs> Straight down the middle, big zero for yes. that death. Okay. And then of course we get like the close encounters ending, or if you'd prefer, mm. Mason, I know you would, the mission to Mars ending with oh, Gary Sinise, yeah. where the aliens are like, "Hello." Do you think this movie was highly inspirational or influential on future movies? Obviously, like you know, Terminator Two, we got the effects evolution there. Yeah. I'm talking like movies like Interstellar. I think or so. Mission to Mars. Mission to Mars. What was that one with? Kirsten Stewart and it was underwater and everything was sinking and it was aliens? Uh, Twilight, but we're seeing it on uh, a pier and the pier's hit by a speedboat <laughs> and we go underwater. Speed 2. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I know, think maybe. so, definitely. Yeah. It's, I think especially the movie making of the 90s as well where, you know, like for Backdraft, for example, they built a big set that could catch on fire and all of that. <laughs> and I they, think that's all sets, actually. Well, not, yeah, that's true, but I mean intentionally. Oh, terrific, Which yes. they could then put out. That's not something I feel like they do as much now. Mm. But yes, I think there was a lot of filmmaking in this which showed what could be possible in terms of scale and scope and yeah. if you put the money and time into it. Mm. What do you think of the alien design though or that ending where the aliens like the humanity's not great ed harris and ed harris is like humanity's great actually and then the aliens are like here's a slideshow of all the wars and he's like ah oh, <laughs> tape this off the telly yeah you got me <laughs> Look, it's, okay we get the history channel down yeah. here yeah uh, surprise i didn't think you, you'd have any of that i didn't think you had the antenna for it shit <laughs> but he gets out of it because and he's some talk back radio <laughs> listen to these people okay, they're all insane <laughs> yeah is jerry springer <laughs> look at this We've seen it. Why's that man hitting that other man with a chair? It's rude. <laughs> it is rude, lift your game, it? humanity. Yeah. Anyways, uh, as I mentioned, this was a nightmare of a time. I bet. And here we go. This is a section of the show called What a Nightmare of a Time Everybody wow. Had. Wow. <laughs> so the cast and crew for this did, on average, 70-hour weeks for six months, right? It's a long time. I agree. And this was changed dramatically because at one point, a lightning storm ripped a hole in a black tarp covering the tank 
which was making it look you know, much darker underneath. Uh-huh. And since repairing it would take too much time and production was already running over, they just started shooting it at night. So Terrific. everybody's just rolling in in the cold, just uh-huh. jumping around in the water. Ed Harris also actually said this about the revival scene, right? You remember the mm-hmm. famous revival scene, Mason? Sure, sure, sure. I was slapping her across the face and I see that they've run out of film in the camera. There's a light on the camera and nobody has said anything. And Mary Elizabeth stood up and said, we're not animals and walked off the set. They were going to just let me keep slapping her around. It was very difficult. So if he hadn't have noticed, just slapping her for no reason. Wow. Uh, Michael Bean also claimed that he was in South Carolina for five months, but only acted for three to four weeks. He remember one day being 10 metres underwater and suddenly the lights went out and it was so black I couldn't see my hand. I couldn't surface. I realised I might not get out of here. And that was probably the nicest nearly drowning story that I have, Mason. That's terrific. Reportedly. <laughs> reportedly was he going through a divorce with everybody <laughs> on this film? <laughs> Is that, that what was happening? <laughs> <laughs> reportedly, uh, Ed Harris punched James Cameron when he nearly drowned. I think it might have been the moment, you know, when he puts the, the bowl over his head? Yeah, sure. Of the water rising? Mm-hmm. That was real. And oftentimes, he would be underwater, swimming about, with a bowl on his head, Filled with water. So that wasn't a, like a secondary They would plate. sometimes do that, okay, but so it was mostly just a bowl of water in a big bowl of water. Right, so because my assumption during most of that was it was two layers of glass and, and with pink liquid no. in between the glass. But that, that wouldn't explain how he was exhaling yes. and bubbles were coming out because you couldn't do that. And it couldn't was, do that these days. No, and it was chlorinated. So oh, he no. had like... He had contacts in to stop it stinging, but he said on the day that he nearly drowned, on the way home he pulled his car over because he burst into spontaneous crying. Ed Harris. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) James Cameron had a drowning experience as well, Mason. Oh, wow. So he was in the underwater set. Uh, Everyone tried to drown him simultaneously. (laughs) The AD who was supposed to monitor the director's oxygen levels was on a break and Cameron needed air quickly. So he stripped off his gear, including the helmet, and tried to rise to safety. A safety diver went to help by offering him a spare breathing regulator, but it was faulty and Cameron ended up accidentally sucking in a lot of water. Cameron struggled to get free, but the safety diver assumed he was distressed and kept a hold of him until Cameron punched him in the face. That's true. A lot of punching, a lot of drowning. Uh, I feel those are two of the least desirable uh, uh, features of a film set, punching and drowning. I would agree with that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, The assistant director and the diver were fired the same day. No shock there. Uh, James Cameron and producer Gail Ann Hurd, as mentioned, divorced while the filming was in pre-production. I think it was also dating Catherine Bigelow at the same time as well. So I don't know what his mental state was, Mason. Uh, Based on this movie, great. (laughs) (laughs) The tank was so huge that it had its own weather. It's a virtual planetary. Has its own weather system. And the water was often too murky to film in. Local goats sometimes invaded the set, destroying equipment and urinating on the floors. The constant cold and submersion caused many to come down with ear and sinus infections. Too much exposure to chlorine burned divers' skin and turned their hair green or white. Filming was also delayed once due to a bomb threat. Ed Harris had such a traumatic experience making the film that he refused to go into detail about it for years. One of the few things he said about it was, asking me how I was treated on the abyss is like asking a soldier how they were treated in Vietnam. Plus, I had toilet hand for the next five years. (laughs) They had to make up my hand on every subsequent movie. In The Rock, I've got toilet hand. You can see it. Michael Ben's in The Rock. It's true. Anyway, it's time for green trivia slash the guy who yells Rodney until he's killed by Swamp Thing. Rodney! 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 Nice. Now, according to the studio, uh, there was a rumour that a real rat was drowned during the making of this film. But that's in fact false. Five rats were used to film the drowning sequence and they all lived. So real oxygenated fluorocarbon fluid was used in the rat fluid breathing scene. Does that make sense? Yes. So this technique... It only makes sense because I've seen the movie. If (laughs) I didn't, if I hadn't seen the movie, I wouldn't know what you're talking about. This technique was actually pioneered real technique and there was detailed instructions on how to prepare the fluid. Now, the only reason they cut away... Pour it into a bowl, stick a rat in it. (laughs) Three bobs your uncle. (laughs) The only reason for cutting to the actors' faces was to avoid showing the rats defecating from momentary panic as they began breathing the fluid. So they say it was like harmless and the rats survive. Uh But there is a moment of like... I'm drowning. Yeah. Yeah. Cameron I, kept yelling at the rat. It's a fluor, fluorinate carb. It's, it's oxygenated, oxygenated water fluor fluor carb. You, you idiot. Stop panicking and pooing. <laughs> you rat bitch. I also read that one of the rats died and James Cameron resuscitated it and then he kept it for a year, but I, I don't know, man. That sounds like um, 
a bit of you know a bit of bit of PR from from his team, just like say he brought a rat back to life. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to get in trouble with big rat. Mm. In England, I think they had to take. That's out- Mickey Mouse. <laughs> yes, in England they had to take out that scene because of because it was you know cruel. They had to take the nunchucks out of his hands as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, Mason. The studio was considering for the lead role: Mel Gibson, Dennis Quaid, William Hurt, Harrison Ford. Can you imagine Harrison Ford doing this? Yeah. I just don't think he would have just done it or put up with any of this. Yeah, I yeah. don't know if uh, James Cameron would have made any movies subsequent to this because yeah. he would have been punched in the head too many times. <laughs> or maybe they would have got along famously because because well, James Cameron is the master of the ocean. Yeah. Harrison Ford is the master of getting stoned and flying a little plane. <laughs> well, you might be right because that speaks to somebody involved in this and, and we'll talk about yes. in a minute. Uh, also considered were Kurt Russell and Patrick Swayze. Now, James Cameron actually suggested Ed Harris, but the studio was concerned about his lack of experience as a leading man, as well as his receding hairline. Uh-oh. But James Cameron felt that this added to his everyman appeal. So Harris actually convinced the... He st- looks like a divorced man, like every man's been divorced. <laughs> Harris convinced the studio with a screen test where he wore a motorcycle helmet as a diving helmet. So they were like, oh, we can put a helmet on him for some of this. Yeah, nice. That's great. Now, Ed Harris actually... It's kind of crazy. He considered getting a hair transplant procedure for his thinning locks. However, Mm -hmm. his donor hair area on the back of his head was considered too sparse for follicular harvesting. And that, coupled with the bluish hue of his hand, led to the working title of this movie being Blue Harvest Mason. That's very good. I think you Uh, telegraphed it. That's actually the working title of Star Wars, uh, Mm. original Star Wars. Go on, though. I was going to say, I think you telegraphed it too hard by going, this is quite interesting. (laughs) Here we go. Here's a fun interesting Right, I should have. I'm going to keep it low-key, don't I? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, you're right. Okay. James Cameron's brother, Mike Cameron, played a dead crewman inside the sunken submarine. He had the T-shirt on, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To accomplish this, he had to hold his... He killed his brother. (laughs) To accomplish this, he killed his own brother. (laughs) To To accomplish this, he had to hold his breath under 25 feet of water whilst also allowing a crab to crawl out of his mouth. I remember when I saw that, I'm like, I think they would have had to use a real crab for that. Mm. (laughs) Like a man would have held a crab and it scudded out, and that is what happened. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Orson Scott Card, he wrote the novelization of this. Also, don't look into him. You're not going to be happy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, he described working with James Cameron as hell on wheels. He claimed that Cameron was nice to him because Card could afford to walk away, while Cameron was miserable and unkind to everybody else. Card also stated that unless he changed his way of working with people, I hope he never directs anything of mine. Oh. Uh, now, there's a whole lot of stories similar to this on Titanic, which we will cover next week. Uh, but this didn't have the box office of a Titanic or a Terminator 2, Mason. Very On a true. budget of $47 million, it only made $90 million. It was considered a moderate hit, but I, not by much. Maybe by Hollywood accounting, perhaps. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it has done well, you know, in distribution and additional release and TV rights and all of that. They sold so many DVDs, they sold them out, we can't get one anymore. Can't even get a single one. Not even that guy, you know, who sells mm-hmm. them out of the boot of his car and whatever, Mason. Mm-hmm. I think in America they call it a trunk. Yes. And in the UK they call it a biscotti. Huh. Is that true? No. I think it is. Huh. Don't look into it. Mason, what do you think of the, the Abbas? What? The movie we watched and oh, have been talking about. I see. Yeah. I mean, I, technically, I think it's a, it's, it, you know, an technically incredible... Technically, they nearly killed a bunch of people. Well, I was going right. to say, technically, it's, it's, I guess it's an incredible feat, but I guess that is easier when you don't care about anybody <laughs> <laughs> who's helping you make it. So, yeah, you easier. know, points down for that. Uh, it's, you know, I, I think even if we'd seen the two-hour version, I think it probably would have, it could have done with an edit. Just yep. to speed up the pace a little bit. Sure. You know? yeah, but, fair enough. But I mean, maybe... It's interesting, right? It's interesting, sure. Yeah. But I, I understand why it's not Aliens or Terminator or True Lies. Mm. or Because you know. there's no Aliens or Terminator or, or Mr. True Lies. Well, there's Aliens in it. but yeah. True Lies. Different, different Aliens, though. Mm. Yeah. Anyways, here's a hint towards next week. Is it Titanic? Is it? Yeah. Nice. You've never seen Titanic, have I've you? I've never seen Titanic. Wow. Except for snippets when I would turn on Channel 10. Yeah. Sunday Night Movie, <laughs> 8.30. You know, it's on for four to five hours. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Or over two nights. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, no, I've not seen it. Wow. Well, that should be very interesting. My only memory of it, of course, is uh, Billy Zane going, another round of drinks, my good man. Ah, ha, ha, which doesn't happen. <laughs> I'm pretty confident, but it just seems like a, a thing he would do. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? But if people want to see that early, and they can, Mason, yeah. if they head over to bigsandwich.co where the videos always go up early. But that's not the only thing going on there, Mason. What? We've got bonus 
movie commentaries. We've got audio podcasts, Mason. My goodness. We've got a bunch of things, just thousands of hours of stuff that we keep paywalled only for our very best friends. Isn't That's that right. right exactly right. Yeah. And if you pay that $9 per month, you are our best friend. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Or you can just listen to our podcast. That's true, you can that's still free. be one of our regular friends yeah. if you listen to the Weekly Planet. It's got us on YouTube channel, Spotify, Apple, all of those different things. Mm-hmm. We're obviously going to do an Avatar 2, 1, etc. and so forth, yes. Mason. Yes. All right. Thanks, everybody. I grabbed that, Jimmy, guys. We'll see you next week. Don't grab it with your blue toilet hand, though. Don't do it. Don't do it like that. Just gross and yuck. Yuck. <laughs>